So, Ariel, would you just briefly before we ask questions, give a quick summary of your career because you're not that old, but you've done a lot already. Thank you. Um, sure. I um, I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign and uh, I graduated in 2012. And then I, I was in New York for a year after that. I was working in advertising. Um, and then after that, I kind of took a year hiatus to do some career exploration. I launched a website and I called it something totally corny. It was called uh, Out of Office Revolution. And it was, it was just a really fun blog that I started uh, to do this thing called, it's, I mean, I, I made it up. It's called Rapid Testing Careers. It's a, a concept that's applied to uh, tech startups when you're rapid prototyping a product. But um, essentially, the, the concept is that you want to test something as quickly and as cheaply as possible so that you get uh, to the uh, conclusion or to the, the ideal prototype um, as fast as possible, as fast and as cheap as possible. So I did that with career exploration and I just kind of followed my curiosity and uh, I was always really interested in the arts. And so a lot of uh, interviews that I did with people that work in television, uh, in theater, uh, writers, actors, uh, directors. I also talked to executives that worked in the television industry. And I also talked to people in tech because that was a, a genuine interest of mine at the time. I've always really been interested in entrepreneurship and uh, fascinated by people who uh, who start their own businesses. So I did that for a year. Um, in that year, I also applied to a tech incubator called uh, it was, uh, oh my gosh, it was a, a tech incubator through the Stanford D School, uh, which is their design school and TED, like uh, like TED Talks. So um, they did this thing and I did that for uh, that summer in New York City. And then after that, um, I got recruited at Google and I had a career at Google for um, a couple of years in the Bay Area. I lived in Silicon Valley. Um, and... After that, I, I mean, the whole time that I was there, I, I already knew that I wanted to be a television writer um, and I wanted to be an entertainer. So like I was working at Google and then on nights and weekends, I was writing scripts um, and in the comedy world there. And then by the time I decided I wanted to leave Google to pursue my creative career, um, I had already had like writing samples um, and had taken kind of like uh, the the extra training or classes like prior to that um, in Chicago, New York City, and San Francisco. So, um, and then I, in 2017, I got my first television job on a show called The Last Man on Earth. It was on Fox uh, with Will Forte, who is uh, was a star on SNL. And um, after that, I worked on a show called Hentified, which just which premiered in February. Um, oh, yeah. I'm proud of it. Um, and I just worked on. It. Disney show um, or a Disney Plus show that will premiere uh, sometime next year. Can you give the title of the Disney Plus show, or is it still? Uh, yeah, it's called uh, it's called The Big Shot, and it's uh, it, the press release has already come out. It's starring John Stamos, um, and it's uh, about a girls' high school basketball team, and it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be awesome. It, we were shooting before this this pandemic happened, and um, what we've shot so far is like it's really like heartwarming and super funny. So what made you decide to attend HT? Oh, um, I went to Holy Trinity. Um, it was, I mean, Holy Trinity is like a, a family uh, tradition. I, my whole family went to Holy Trinity. My, my mom, my aunt, my uncle um, were all, my, all my, my cousins uh, were students at Holy Trinity. When it came to time to apply to high school, it, um, it was, uh, it was one of the one of the options that I applied to, and then ultimately felt felt right. My name is Susie. I personally love Gentified. I watched all of the seasons in two days with my family. So like, I just want to say good job. Like, we really loved it. And my question is like, what do you most like about it? What do I most like about Gentified? Um, that's a super good question. Um, I would say. Honestly, I remember being on set and watching the dailies. Um, the dailies are essentially like after when you're done shooting for the day, you get like a bunch of different scenes that you've shot from uh, the director. They're completely just raw. They're not edited in any way. 
um, and you can see what you've been shooting. And I remember watching the dailies and there was a, the scene where um, Pop and uh, Eric are having a moment in the kitchen when he breaks down and, and cries because he was gonna ask Lydia to marry him and and it didn't happen. But, um, and, I, and it was like these two men crying together. I, I like, I lost it, like watching uh, the dailies. And it was, like I said, like a completely unedited raw version of the scene. So a lot of the times when you're making TV, like it's a little scary to see what TV is before it hits the screen. It like, there's some moments where you're just like, oh my God, this is, you know, what are we making? Um, <laughs> but there, we, I had so many moments that uh, were just genuine and just felt like very authentic moments that like really like, either brought me to tears or made me laugh out loud. And um, it like dawned on me that we had something really special. Um, so I'd say the talent that we got to work with and that we got to tell um like all the stories that we wanted to tell and work on something that i like a, a story that was worth telling there's a lot of stuff on tv that you know isn't necessarily important um and i think what we wrote was is important for a lot of people what does the story editor do um the story editor it's just a title so it basically um with the writers room everybody has a title and only the only one per only one of the writers has a title that actually has the word writer in it which is really interesting and it's the most uh junior person on the staff uh so it's basically the titles that a writer gets is just so that the guild can track how much experience you have and it also determines um also like how much you get paid so um it just means that i'm no longer the, the most junior person uh in a writer's room which is pretty cool um so i was uh the staff writer on the last man on earth because it was my first job and then i got promoted to story editor on my next show which was Tentified. and then on my my third show i got promoted again to executive story editor and then my next show i'll be a producer so um it just it's just um i still i still write all of the episodes with the rest of the writers so um also every writer gets their own credit on an episode but we all collectively wrote every episode of the series. So um, I, it just means I write with, with a different title. Who was in the writer's room? Well, not, 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 not the names of the people, but what are the titles of the people in the room? And how many people are there in the room writing each episode? Uh, it changes from room to room. So it depends on how many episodes the network or studio orders uh, will depend on how um, many writers we get, but it also just depends on the budget of the show. So um, with Last Man on Earth, it was, we had 11 writers, but we also had 18 episodes, which is a full season of network television. Um, and with Hentified, we only had 10 episodes and we had um, three writers, a showrunner. A showrunner is, based, is just a person, the head writer of the room and two creators. So three, four, five, six people total um, in the Hentified writer's room. Oh, okay, well, my question was just like, who has been your motivation on like your career journey or like what has motivated you? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I mean, I would say when I first started my career um, in general, like after college, when I was trying to do, when I was exploring and every time I had a professional goal, I would say that my family was um, my motivator. Um, there was like a lot of like that narrative uh, that you see play out and hentified it if you've seen it, um, where you're you know trying to make your family proud. Um, but I would say now, um, now I think a lot of that comes like really intrinsically from myself. Um, I I feel like after so much exploration that I've done over the last like decade that. Um, I really feel from a deep down place that I'm like really in my purpose when I am being creative and when I'm um, making things and I'm expressing myself. So um, a lot of that motivation like now just comes from like an inner well of just knowing that I've like found my path in life. I basically just have a question about, I know you said you write. So like, do you go to set and if you do go to set, like, what's a typical day for you if you're on set, like, with the actors and stuff? Yeah. Um, so I do go to set. Um, it, it it will change, like, with streaming now being, you know, uh, 
some uh, type of how we see television, um, it works different than network. And I've done I've done both. So um, I'll answer first for network, and then I'll answer for streaming. So um, with network television, basically means that there will come a time when the writers' room is writing episodes as we're producing episodes. So there will be people shooting while we're writing. Um, and when that happens, uh, we we went to set all the time because our stages were adjacent to the writer's room. Um, and then whenever it was our episode specifically that we were writing, we would go on set to write the episode. But that was also because Will Forte was the was a writer on the show, but also the star of the show. So um, there was really no, like at, at certain point, it was like the writer's room and, and being on set were just kind of the same thing at one point. And that is a little bit different than a normal experience but it was my first, so I didn't know, I didn't know that it wasn't normal. Um, and that involved just like writing in a lot of really interesting locations. Like um, we wrote um, episodes on like Will's, Will's trailer on the beach. We wrote on a yacht, we wrote in a prison cell, we wrote, um, you know, in a tiny trailer, you know, that was overly air conditioned. Like we just kind of, made it work. Um, with Hentified, uh, with streaming, usually the writer's room will take place over 16 to 20 weeks in uh, one part of the year, and then we'll finish the writer's room. And then like a few months later, they'll start shooting. And so it's totally separate. However, you will go to set for your own episode that you wrote to produce it. And what that looks like is a standard like 12, well, for, for this industry, standard 12 hour production day. Um, anything over that it is, uh, you have to pay the whole crew. Um, overtime has to get approved also. Um, and it, de it changes depending on what kind of scenes that we're shooting that day. So sometimes we'll have see like we'll have to be there at like five in the morning and then we'll plan to be there, you know, for 12 hours until we finish. Uh, for my episode, there was one that we had an overnight shoot. So we didn't get there till like, 3 p.m. But we were there overnight and didn't leave until about like three or four in the morning. Um, and a lot of that is uh, being in a in a tent called Video Village, and it's a tent with just a bunch of monitors and where the director is um, sitting, um, and you're just watching the monitors with your script in your hand and making sure that the director is getting every shot that you and the showrunner talked about beforehand what it is that you need to get for the day. So by the time that you're on set, you should, as a writer, you need to have like the whole script like memorized backwards and forwards. Like you should be the one person on that whole set that knows the script more better than anybody. And every time the director has a question, because sometimes the showrunner is not there, you have to, you know, be on the same page with the showrunner. Um, and your job on set is to make sure that every shot that you've already pre-discussed get you're getting it um and that you're getting a bunch of different options from the actors depending on your relationship with the director you can either give your notes to the director so the director can give to the actors or you know or speak to the actors yourself just depending on like the relationship that you have with the people on set the the your female lead is doing face painting at the she's being paid a lot of money to do face painting at a rave like party mm -hmm. among rich white people or yeah. That scene, and and the, and her is it her brother or her cousin ends her, up climbing up a ladder. Oh, her cousin, yes. Yeah. How was that shot? I mean, did you have the shots in mind, or did you guys just bring a camera into a scene and do a lot of filming and then put it together in the editing room? No, that was uh, um, that that scene. Um, it was my favorite scene to write. It was. Um, it's a wonderful scene. Thank you. And the, we, we wrote the episode around this set piece. And when we were shooting it, we um, it was shot in a bunch of different takes. So because the, the way that the room was set up was just made it so that we had to kind of shoot in different to move a couple times. But this was our overnight that that whole scene was the overnight shoot that I was talking about. Uh, we, we were on set till like three or four in the morning and um, it was uh, so like fun to shoot we had um the day that we shot that the makeup department paint 
like got there like early before we um, when we were shooting other scenes and people would come to the makeup department. Everybody got their makeup done. So uh, America Fair directed that episode, and uh, she came in like she's a regular. She she does Burning Man every year, so she came in like her Burning Man costume, uh, one of her Burning Man costumes. Um, I came in a costume. The makeup department did my makeup and her makeup. Everyone kind of behind the scenes also looked like somebody who was at the party. Um, and uh, it was just like super fun. The whole like cast and crew like got, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera were involved. We had like a hundred extras on set that day. Um, and we, the scene where Carlos climbs the tower, he did that in one take. Um, most of it, he didn't want, he didn't want to be um, naked in front of a hundred extras and an entire crew. Which is understandable. So, uh, but he he nailed it. <laughs> also worried about his safety. I mean, you know, it would not be good to fall from up there. Obviously, no, it's, it wasn't. It, I mean, it looks way high, like way larger um, on camera. It was not. It was not that high um, when we were, you know, on set. It was like a pretty um, low. It's like special lenses and, and angles uh, that made it look like he was higher than he was. <laughs> What's like the best part of your job, and like, what do you think is like the worst part? So, like, the best thing. Like, the worst. Hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, I would say the best, the best part of my job is, um, is that you you get to like play a lot and make stuff up and see your imagination literally come to life. Um, I would say it's like the weirdest, most bizarre way to see um, manifestation happening, like so rapidly, where you could be um, in a writer's room, just joking with the other writers and kind of riffing, come up with an idea for something. And then a few weeks later, see like a crew of people build you know, a set that is something like what you imagined in your brain. And then to see that, like that, that is like the, the best part of my job. Um, I love what, I love when the set is being built. Um, it just feels like I'm living inside my, my imagination. It just, I think the, the politics of, of Hollywood and um, also just with tell it's such a collaborative medium. You cannot, it's not like writing a movie where you kind of, pull up by yourself and write something you're writing with a group of people you're working with a director you're working with actors you're working with the art department you're working with editors um and there's so many different personalities and so sometimes you're really lucky and you get to work with a whole team of people that like really like each other and but then other times there's a lot of you know po politics to maneuver and it. it's like a, a a bizarro weird version of what I probably is like for you also <laughs> So my question was, um, what character did you relate to or like what character is your favorite in your new show? Um, I would say in the writer's room, though, uh, we didn't have a cast yet. And we uh, so they were just, you know, people that we were building on a page. And I would say in the writer's room, my favorite characters were um, Chris and Anna. And I just like. I related very much to you, Anna in the sense that um, she wanted to be an artist and nobody around, and she didn't really have an example around her to kind of show her what that was like, how to do that um, with so with with not a lot of the resources that a lot of artists need when they're first getting started, and um, and also just her relationship to her grandfather. Um, you know, you kind of see her being a little bit like sheltered and taken care of um in a way that the boys kind of don't and that was that was like a lot like my experience being you know my my grandfather's um first grandkid we just have like that special bond and um you know i, I don't know i just related to their very adorable relationship and uh, and then also like yeah her her wanting to be an artist under you know and not kind of having the resources um at that age that she needs to kind of really take off. Um, and then Chris, you know, I think Chris feeling like he doesn't really belong um, was a, an experience that I, you know, always feel super familiar with wherever I go. 
Um, it was, you know, even being here in LA, like I would say the, the Mexican American community here is like very distinct and different than the Mexican community in Chicago, uh, which is like, it's a whole, a whole different thing. And, you know, that is obviously related to a bunch of different factors and geography and proximity to Mexico, I think being one of them, but also just generationally, um, you know, I was the only person in the, um, in the writer's room who was like a third generation Mex Mexican American and, and not first generation and, or didn't have an immigrant experience. So um, I always try to, you know, to feel like you fit in somewhere. Um, all those experiences with those two characters, I think really felt easy for me to write into the scripts. How did you have the courage to keep pursuing your dreams? How did I like her? Have the courage to keep pursuing your dreams. That's a good question. I don't know if I, I it was I don't know if I was ever afraid that it wasn't going to work out, but I had moments like in the process where I was like just I, I felt just very alone because I didn't have a I didn't have there was no path carved out for me. It wasn't like taking the job at a, at a like a corporate company and and having the path kind of laid out for me and, and knowing what was next. I kind of always was leaping from you know like one branch to another branch and hoping that yeah I was going to catch it. So. Um, I would say like in retrospect, um, it was just like holding that vision um, there. I think this is true for everybody. What, you know, it, it's not how we're conditioned or taught by our families or in school even, but I think that every person is born with a unique set of gifts and talents and purpose and has a map already kind of, you know, embedded in us and we just kind of forget that based on the conditioning that we receive from other people and um and other people's experiences and i think that as long as like you take moments to tap into what that is for you i think we all kind of know it when we're children because we haven't had the time yet to be you know totally conditioned by the world um just like to hold that vision and then you just, you know, you hold a vision and you kind of make a plan. And I think as long as you hold that vision, no matter what reality looks like, it, and it does feel like lying to yourself sometimes, but it, it's not, it's just, it's truth and it's always truth. And sometimes reality doesn't reflect that around you, but that's just for that one moment, you know, it doesn't make it not true. And so I would say knowing, um, even though I was scared a lot, I think from an early age and I like definitely didn't pick this up from my my family, um, it was just knowing that everything is mental, um, everything, it's, it's all a mental game. So um, it's not necessarily about like knowing that, like I, there were moments that I just knew like that things were not fair. Like I knew that I had to work a lot harder for, than a lot of other people uh, and figure things out for myself. But I just always knew that that path was mine. So it just never, it never occurred to me to like give up. It was just kind of like, okay, well, this is, um, I kind of kind of looked at it like a math problem, you know, it was just like, this is like, I'm here and what I want is here. And then there's like these things to solve for. So I just have to like fill in the gaps and then I'm going to get there. Um, and I did that, but then I also sought out mentors. Um, so I will say that to you. Uh, it's really important. Mm -hmm. Seek out people who uh, believe in you and who are going to feed you um, the words of encouragement that you need and that are going to support you in your dreams. It could be your parents, but it might not be. And uh, it might be a friend. It might be a teacher. Um, but so I would just like always surround yourself with like five people that um, are kind of pushing you forward. You ha as a female writer, you you had the. Uh, I know lots of female writers who are fighting now to get noticed, and then also as a Latinx writer, uh, was this a, is this a factor? And is this a factor in getting mentors? You know, it's it's really interesting. Is that like uh, not not really, and um, and it doesn't mean that it's that it's not true that Hollywood still is very much very male and very white. Um, and very closed. It's a very small town. Like it's, uh, it's crazy. Like how, like everyone knows everyone here. 
Um, so it's not like a lot of people and even the people who get, who come into the industry, a lot of times it's like a lot of nepotism. So like actors that are super famous that you probably, you know, know of, like you probably have no idea that their parents are also super famous, you know, like they just, it's really interesting and bizarre, but, um, it hasn't like really been, um, my first show was like I said, on the last man on earth and that show, um, half the room was women and, um, there were two, me and another woman who were, uh, women of color and, um, Pentified was um, all women with one man, uh, Marvin. And my last show was also half, the room was half women. So um, I, that, I, I, I don't know, like it's been interesting because I haven't had the experience of being in an all male room or um, being on set with um, just a bunch of dudes, but it's definitely not, uh, I would say when I talk to other people, it's not a normal, I think, experience. Most people have had rooms where they're the only woman or the only person of color. They're, um, so I, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe I've gotten very lucky. But I also think that when you meet, like, I, I've gotten really lucky in terms of meeting really good people and good people, like, no other good people. So. If you have the opportunity to, like, create your own movie, like, by your own, like, writing and stuff like that, what would be, like, what is the team? What is all about? Be yeah, before before this uh, before this pandemic happened, like, that was kind of what was, what I had my eyes, my sight on next uh, was creating, uh, creating my own series and, uh, and doing that the one that I'm currently writing for that is set in a, um, in a burlesque setting, um, which is, I also do burlesque dancing and it's set in my college town, um, and, or the college you know, where I went to school and yeah, I'm super excited about it. So it's kind of, I'm, um, uh, I'm a big fan of David Lynch, who is, a uh, um, a really, um, successful and weird uh director who also made a, a tv series called twin peaks in the 90s um and it came back for uh another season in 2017 um and i'm a big fan of that show so it kind of has a lot of the influences um of of that show um it's probably like twin peaks meets glow and um it's an ensemble um an ensemble series uh, where um, I also get to be one of the characters. So I would say like, yeah, my, my next, I have my eyes, my, my eyes set on being able to write, perform and direct on my own series. Um, and that's, that's my dream. Okay. My question is, I know you said earlier that sometimes you're in a room with people that you don't really agree with. So mm -hmm. how would you like professionally deal with that? Um, if it's something that I don't agree with for the story, you know, like, it's just like, maybe um, I just don't think a character would do that. Then that's a really safe conversation to have at the table, you know, as long as you're giving people the space to finish their thought, um, to say what they have to say. Um, it's totally acceptable to, to say, you know, like, I see what you're saying. Um, Actually, you know, I wonder if it's, it's another thing. I think um, there's like real, there's like special language that you learn in a writer's room because it's like you have a group of writers who are uh, by nature of being artists and being writers are just have weird personalities and uh, are very sensitive you know, to like their, you know, their ideas. So um, the way that I always frame it um, is acknowledging that their ideas like good and valid and you know thinking them and then also saying i wonder if this other possibility alternative it op it opens up um the conversation to more possibilities instead of shutting down the conversation uh because you don't agree with yeah. something. and also if you don't agree with something you only say something if you have an, a, a solution to like fill in the gap because so many people like it's so easy to have a problem or not to agree with something that somebody says but you know it's our job to kind of 
come up with ideas. So um, you always want to have a solution if you don't agree with something. So you'll say, you know, acknowledge the person. I see what you're saying. I wonder if what you're saying, because then it just opens up, you know, the conversation to more possibilities instead of shutting it down. And then, um, and then you fill in, you know, after I wonder if with your solution um, is like the best way to handle a creative disagreement at the table. My question was, how did you get into writing? Like, when did you first start? Th yeah, thank you for that. The I first started. I mean, I first started writing when I was when I was a a kid. Um, like, I think the, the first story that I wrote was through, with pictures uh, before. Um, I, I knew literally how to write anything. Um, I had a, a picture book that my uh, I illustrated and my grandmother, um, you know, wrote down, I like, dictated to her what I wanted the story to be about. And that was, I don't know, I was like four, you know, like when I first started writing stories. Um, and then I wrote in grade school, uh, really bad poetry. Um, and I got my my first poem published in sixth grade. And um, so I think there was always clues as to that kind of maybe being the path that I might take on as an adult. Um, and then in college, um, I was, uh, I wrote for an online magazine in college. I wrote different, like just feature pieces and stuff. Um, and I didn't really know how to be a writer though. like as a job after college. So um, I didn't start, um, I guess, trying to find professional ways that I could make a living as being a writer until after college. So I was uh, 22 when I started uh, comedy writing. Um, I took a class, I took a playwriting class at the Gorilla Tango Theater in Chicago, um, which is not far from Holy Trinity actually. And I wrote my first piece of comedy writing there and uh, put it up. I got to cast it with Second City Actors and put it up on a stage. And that was the first time that I knew that um, I wanted to explore um, comedy writing and that I wanted to explore script writing. So then after that, I started taking classes at the Second City and, um, and then Improv Olympic. And, um, and then I just kind of like, Googled a bunch of scripts that I could find online and and really kind of put together my own self learning and self study curriculum. And I just taught myself how to write scripts um, and practiced when I wasn't in class at the Second City and uh, and IO. As you mentioned before about, you know, since you have to like know the script more than the people that actually have to like, you know, learn it. I wonder like, what if some like what if someone like is like like acting and then they say like a similar word or a similar phrase to the one that you wrote? Do you call them out for it or do you just let do, do you just let it roll on? Um, it it depends on what the, what the word is. Like if it's something that's like part of a joke and that person's not hitting the word and it's taking away from the punchline or it's taking away from um, it landing in an, you know, in a way, then yeah, you say something. Um, but you also have a person's uh, on set whose job is to notice those things. So they're called a script coordinator. Um, and they will like, they will um, make sure that things are said the way they're supposed to be said, and, and then they'll say something. Um, and or they'll say something to you and say, hey, this person keeps saying this instead of that. Do you want to move on or do you want to say something? And then you can say whatever, you know, it's, it doesn't make a difference or it, sound, it might just be because it sounds way more natural saying it another way that the actor prefers. And sometimes that's OK, but um, sometimes it's not, you know, like sometimes it's like it has to be said a certain way because there are you know, it's colloquial to the city that we're shooting, you know, that the, the story takes place in or it um or like i said it's part of a joke and, and it kind of has to be said that way you just kind of have to use your your judgment and if the showrunner is is on set with you then ask the showrunner um and if they're not then yeah you have to use your discernment to kind of decide so how did you feel 
moving to Hollywood? Did you, did you think it was a good or bad decision? How do I feel about it? I I, I love it here. I um I feel like it was 100% the right choice for me to make. Um, I don't know if I felt ready, you know, to move here. When I moved, I was really scared. And um, my first year here was like awful, like everything that you could imagine, like to not like go well, other than getting a job, <laughs> other than getting a job. So it was like, it was a really difficult year for me on a personal level. Um, the, but um, I got, like I moved to Hollywood and then I broke into Hollywood that same year. So, and that's not, I don't think that's like a typical story. Um, so I, I, it was, I know in my bones, it was 100% the right choice. My, my whole life changed when I moved here, but, um, but it wasn't easy. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. So it was the right choice. It was really difficult. I cried a lot my first year. Um, I was miserable my first year and that was also the best thing that I could have done. And like now, now I feel like comfortable here. I have a community here of people of, you know, in the industry, but I also have just really good friends here. Um, I see myself kind of establishing myself here for the, you know, I, I, like I don't see me, myself moving anywhere else um, anytime soon. Well, let's transition it from college to your job now, Hart. Um, well, there was a big gap between college and my job now. So no, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I graduated at college in 2012 and then I had my first TV, TV job when I was in 2017. So there was like, quite, you know, a few years in between college, between college and the working world, of course, it's really kind of, you know, I remember kind of knowing right away that like going to a nine to five job was, I, you know, I was like, I can't, I can't just do this until I die. Like that's, really wrong for me um so that was a hard transition but i was it was hard because it wasn't it wasn't for me um transitioning into this job um is not hard it's just hard because t television is not it, it runs in seasons so there's like a beginning and an end date and then there's like the in-between television you know shows that 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 part is hard to adjust to um because you're just like always having to re to redo your routine. So it's like you go from having one schedule and then to not having a schedule and then you kind of have to start building. You have to have enough discipline to uh, to build your own day. And that's way harder of a transition than college to anything. When you're writing or when you're having trouble writing, what do you do to like get the creative juices flowing? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I love this question. Um, I, the, to get the creative juices flowing when I have writer's block or, or just a creative block is, um, I, I stop writing and I stop trying to figure it out. Um, I, I've only learned this like the hard way. Um, so I think when I was first starting out, like I used to try to like, okay, like sit at my desk for like way more hours than I should. And I'd like try to think my way through the, the problem, um, but that would always just end up, I always end up just like in a deeper hole than when I s started in. So um, I completely, I walk away from it. Um, you, I just like let it go. I, there's no, like, I let it go. Um, I do something else. Uh, it can be anything else. Sometimes, sometimes it's doing something else that's creative. So I'm also, I also dance. So sometimes it's dancing. Uh, sometimes it's painting. Um, I have a, a canvas in my, in my living room, um, that like I used to paint on. Sometimes it's, um, just washing the dishes or, you know, going to the, you know, before good to the, this, going to the gym. Um, yeah, I walk away from, I wait, I'll, I walk away from whatever I'm working on that is causing a creative block because the moment that you walk away, you, um, you allow like your brain to take a, a rest and then it just becomes open and receptive to the solution. So um, a lot of the times we think that solutions come from here, which is, you know, our thinking mind, uh, which isn't true. 
um, usually nothing like this only serves like a certain purpose, right? Like you, we need this, our thinking brain to kind of to solve problems like math, you know, or to be able to focus in school. Um, I would say when you're trying to solve something creatively, like we have two minds, we have the thinking mind and then we have the heart mind. And the heart mind is where creative solutions come from. And so when we, um, and it has all the answers like to everything. So when we give this a break, we like allow this to take over. And in order to give this a break, you have to walk away and you have to just completely be doing something that allows you to kind of just forget about it. And then sometimes like it's enough to just kind of have it be a seed planted in your subconscious by knowing that you have a problem that you need to solve. But then go take a shower, you know, go wash your dishes, like do some other project that you're excited about or leave your house to like take a walk or something. And then the solution will come to you. And then all of a sudden you're like, you're back, you're back in that flow get of creative um, momentum. And you might have, uh, you know, most of the time, every time I do that, I always end up having the solution, but also then also like two other projects that like come to me, you know, from just stepping away from something. I know writers, that that's a great answer. I know writers who take a nap. Naps, yes, naps are really great. A lot and of stuff comes to me like in like this that weird space between waking up and um being asleep i also know night writers who keep a notebook in the bathroom because the shower seems to be a place where ideas go yes oh my god that happens all the time and i always like uh, when that happens like there's always like a moment where i'm just like no trust yourself it'll still be there when you when you get out of the shower and then you know sometimes it's not and so like i think i just have to like always just run out of the shower when i have an idea because it it'll it'll leave it'll just like slip your mind you know because the ideas come when they come you can't force them yeah that's true so what do you think makes a good story i think ever i mean every story is kind of need, needs kind of like the same like the same elements um you know as far as like it, television is very formulaic in the sense that you have it's usually a three-act structure and you have um, certain things that need to happen in every act. And so I would say on, the, on a very technical level structure, um, and th that's just like the, but I would say like the other thing that is the secret sauce, I guess, like for what makes a good story is um, a unique point of view um, it's just the, the extra thing that you specifically telling the story brings to it. So there is art and then there's craft. And I'd say that right now as like a student, um, which is, I guess, always, right. We're always students, um, is to really master the craft of, of being able to have structure in your writing so that when somebody, so that when you're right, you know, somebody can follow it. And then once you have structure, you uh, then you get to play and you can be an artist and, and you can break structure by making certain choices or you can follow the structure but bring something new to it. Um, but it's oh, as long as it's told from your point of view, like it's something that only you can tell the world, that's what makes it special. So um, it's those two elements of you having knowing how to craft a story and then p infusing your own voice your own your own point of view something that is very unique to your experience and bringing that to it that will blow anyone's you know mind over just having a generic story that structurally makes sense but doesn't um doesn't really isn't authentic to who you are you know that's a great answer for Peter Art. Thanks. Um, I have a final question, and I guess I've saved a more difficult question for last. Um, what did you learn at HT that prepared you for your life after high school? I think Holy Trinity provided me with um, the like a, a very safe exper experience where I felt um, like I built like it built my confidence, and so. I would say that the I, I learned how to be a, a confident um, at Holy Trinity, and I think it, it had a lot to do with um, the extra attention that you get when you're at a school. That's one, just the size of Holy Trinity, um, and just like I don't know, like I, 
the teachers that I had, like, were excellent teachers, you know, like, um, and y- yourself included, like, you know, Mr. Helbig, like, I, I think that I, I gained a lot of, um, like, people paid attention to you. And, and that that just felt so special, because I, I went to the University of Illinois, which is a huge, huge university, there's 40,000 students there. So I went from having, you know, like a class of 100 kids to all of a sudden having 40,000 other students on campus. And I, I, a lot of people, a lot of people that I knew really struggled, like, and, you know, either, you know, like, really struggled with their grades, because it was hard to keep up in like large lecture halls, or dropped out of school. And um, I don't think that I, I never felt like that was, it was a challenge for me to be in a school that large. And I think a lot of it had to do with just the confidence that I gained from having teachers who um, really paid it, like saw, like saw me, you know, like, I I think I got a lot of encouragement from teachers and other students. And I just kind of, it allowed me to kind of really figure out like what I was good at because people, you know, like paid attention to what that was. And I don't think I got that. I could have gotten that experience at like, I don't know, like Lane Tech, you know, which is like a gigantic high school also. Well, great answer. Uh, thank you all very much. Could you all unmute and give her applause for spending this time with us? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well done. Very well. Ariel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.